Hello, welcome to this podcast with me, Danny J. Hello, how you doing? I'm from the Click Fusion Academy and Click Team as well. Hope you're doing good. It's Tuesday, the 9th of July, 2019. Halfway through the year already. Over halfway through the year already. Uh, be my daughter's eighth birthday in just four months, and then in just over five months it'll be Christmas. So this year's gone pretty quick. Um, it's been a while since I've done a podcast, maybe a couple of months, I think. So like everybody's been really busy. I've been mega busy um, doing all sorts of things, um, but we've got lots to talk about today. Lots to talk about. Um, I'm I'm going to cover quite a bit. I'm going to cover stuff about the academy. Um, I'm going to cover stuff about the Fusion Workshop 101 um, that happened uh, throughout May. Uh, I'm also going to talk about uh, Fusion 3, uh, 2.5, the DLC. Uh, and we're also going to talk a little bit about the future uh, and what's going to happen, uh, not just with Click Team, but with stuff like the Academy and where everything's going, the direction of things. So uh, what I want to do as well is at the end of this month, uh, I want to do a podcast uh, that's kind of live, like a live podcast, if you will. So I want to get some people involved in Discord. So if you guys want to get involved um, with the July podcast, it's going to be the end of July. And what we're going to do is we're going to get everybody into the Click team um, voice discord or you doesn't have to be the voice specifically it can be uh, you can join the podcast channel uh, and I'm going to take all the questions uh, that people may have so and it's going to be live it's not going to be edited it's not going to be cut it's all going to be live so you guys will be able to check that out so you'll be able to join me uh, I might see if I can uh, get some other people involved um, with the podcast as well the live podcast so you can ask questions whether you want to ask questions about Fusion 2.5, 2.5 plus, uh, Click Team Fusion 3, Click Team as a whole, uh, or anything else, um, it's no holds barred. So I'm going to try and organise that for the end of July. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, I will be sending emails out. If you're a member of the Academy, you'll probably get, you'll definitely get an email about that. Uh, and I'll also put a forum post up on the Click Team forums uh, as well. So let me move my mic a sec. Just a little bit uncomfy there. There we go. I'm still I'm still rocking the headset. I'm not one of these guys that's uh, gonna go out and buy a desktop mic and all that because not my cup of tea. Uh, a head at uh, this headset. I've got a creative headset. One sec. Uh, it's a creative headset that I got. It cost me about forty pound, um, which is probably about fifty sixty dollars. And I tell you what, it's the best headset I've ever had. It's comfortable to wear. Um, the, the microphone, uh, you can move it any direction you want, gives you nice, it's good for podcasts, although a lot of people do prefer the desktop mics. It takes me back to my radio days when I used to work on commercial radio, uh, we used to have the boom mics coming over uh, and used to speak into the boom mic, which was alright, I mean, it was quite good, uh, but I, I oftentimes wondered to myself, why in this day and age, I mean this is going back 10 years, it, it still made me wonder why in this day and age we were still talking into boom mics when everybody could have headsets on, I mean the microphone quality on some of these headsets is phenomenal, um, you know, you can have noise filtration, there's all sorts going on uh, with these uh, new funky headsets. Headset, especially from creative creative have been around the scene since the uh, since the 90s creating sound cards and uh, you know them guys when it comes to audio creative um, are some of the best engineers uh, and manufacturers of audio equipment ever so you know um, obviously you probably hear a few pops on this because um, I seem to have lost um, the microphone cover <laughs> or it didn't come with one maybe I think I bought one uh, I've got a camera box somewhere with all my DSLR stuff in and I have an audio box somewhere as well that has loads of audio stuff in but uh, trying to find stuff like that um, is proves a bit of a chore sometimes all right so what have we got to talk about in this podcast today uh, let's start off with the Academy um, it's nearly can you believe it's nearly three years since we launched the Academy. It's 2.5 years, to be exact. <laughs> Coincidental. Uh, but it's two it's two and a half years since we launched the Academy. Um, I launched the Academy back in December 2016 um, under the title of Fusion Rad. It was called Fusion Rad back then. That's, that's how I launched it as Fusion Rad. Uh, and Fusion Rad was funky. It was a good name. You know, everybody, everybody kind of related to it because it had the word fusion in it. But the problem is um, it didn't really... 
it didn't really excite me. It didn't really excite the brand. So I had to rebrand it to the Click Fusion Academy. I didn't have to, I chose to, because the Click Fusion Academy made more sense. Uh, because obviously it is an academy. The website is, um, some people kind of don't understand what the academy actually is. Initially, when we started off as Fusion Rad, it was meant to be like a course website. So basically you would sign up uh, and you would go through the website, kind of like a course, if you will. Um, that is still the premise of the Click Fusion Academy. When you do sign up as a pro member, the first section you come to is called the plus section. Uh, and that's before you get into all the pro content. So when you sign up as a member, you get access to the uh, both the plus and the pro section. So what, what it is, is you typically you would do the plus section first, which means that you will get um, a complete course on an introduction to Fusion 2.5. Literally, it will handhold you from the beginning. So if you're brand new to clicking Fusion 2.5, um, the Academy is perfect because the plus section, which is the first section on in the, um, in the student hub, uh, that gives you access to all the videos which will introduce you to Fusion 2.5. So like this, this, the interface and everything that um, Fusion does and how to work Fusion. It'll introduce you to global values, global strings, algebra values, algebra strings, and all that kind of stuff. And then when you get onto the... And um, once you've completed the plus section, you're kind of like... Uh, you, you, you're fully acquainted with Fusion 2.5. You're fully aware of what all the objects are, um, what kind of values there are, data types, and all that kind of stuff. So then when you go into the Pro section, it's a little bit more scattered then. It's all about tutorials, and they're all under certain sections like application development, uh, visual effects, and all that. And then you can just pick and choose which ones, you know, which one you want to study. Because I'm a firm believer in um, modular... Um, learning and modular implementation as well, which I'm going to speak about a little bit later on when I get to the, the um, game development uh, topic that I want to talk about. But learning Fusion 2.5, I've learned since I've been teaching it since 2013, so it's last six years, and I've learned along the way that obviously everybody learns differently. Um, everybody learns you know, everybody will learn in their own kind of way. Some people like written tutorials, some most people like video tutorials. Um, the beauty about video tutorials is you can rewind um, and rewatch as many times uh, as you need to until you pick it up. Um, and it's also better for me to do video tutorials because I, I can visually show you stuff uh, as I'm talking about it as well, which is great. Uh, so um, if you're not a member of the Click Fusion Academy, uh, I highly suggest you sign up. Um, especially at the moment because we've got a bit of a discount on, but we've got some awesome stuff that we're giving away as well at the minute. Um, not only do you get over 19 hours of video tutorials, um, we have a shed load of exclusive downloads um, and tutorials in there. I'm going to show you how to create visual effects uh, with Fusion 2.5. Um, we're going to learn in depth about fast loops and for each loops. Um, there's all sorts of stuff, but we're also giving away, if you sign up as a pro member, we're giving away a load of goodies at the minute, which were designed exclusively for the Click Fusion Academy, such as a game developer pack um, that has over 600 development files, graphics, backgrounds, user interface, icons, and all that kind of stuff. There's an exclusive cards extension in there as well. Um, we also have game engines. Um, I, I've also now decided to pack up all the assets that are created for the Academy, such as the Chip Tunes Volume 1, uh, a Fusion FX. So there's a, a Fusion FX package you can download in there, which is a sound effects package, which has over 2,000 sound effects, all royalty free to use. And we have uh, tons and tons of uh, music tracks for you to use in your games as well. So there's lots of assets to be had. Um, just by signing up. Um, we have over um, 160 uh, exclusive tutorials to the Academy. Um, so I highly recommend that, uh, you know, if, you if you're feeling that you want to learn Fusion 2.5 in a better manner uh, and a quicker way and have access to all this kind of stuff, um, then certainly dive in. There's nearly three years worth of content in there uh, and we're still developing content uh, all the time for it as well. So check that out. The link is on the screen. You'll be able to uh, go to the website, click fusion.academy check that out um, <clears throat> but the academy's going well there's lots of things still to look forward to uh, with the academy it's not going anywhere it's still online it's always going to be online uh, and we're doing lots of things um, exclusive for the academy as well um, I can't really reveal right now what uh, we're doing with that um, but I will reveal I will do another podcast when um, when the time comes um, Okay, so uh, what I what I do want to talk about um, this in this podcast today is um, 
stuff about game development exclusively with Fusion 2.5. So, la the last throughout of May, I was quite busy with the Fusion Workshop, um, which is really good. I'll talk about that later on as well. Um, but throughout June, I've obviously had um, a lot of other things going on as well, um, work-wise. And um, what I set out to do was uh, I didn't have any time to myself until uh, this week. So I thought to myself, um, I could do with a couple of days of just a bit of me time, a bit of fusion time, you know, because I have fusion open on my desktop every single day. Um, it, it might sound a little bit unbelievable, um, but every day I'm sat on my computer, uh, which is pretty much every day, uh, I have fusion open and it's been like this for the last 10 years. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I've, as soon as, um, Multi as soon as I got Multimedia Fusion 2, I mean, don't get me wrong, I've been with the Click Team products since time begun, which a lot of you guys have as well, from Click and Play to Click and Create and the Games Factory and all that kind of jazz. But Multimedia Fusion 2, for me, was um, the ultimate um, authoring tool. It was perfect. And obviously, because of the past experience that I had with the other products, it was really easy to get into. Um, but ever since 2009, Fusion has been open on my desktop pretty much every day um, and I'm constantly working with it whether I'm um, doing stuff with click team so for example testing out the betas and um, maybe checking out bugs that people have come across so trying to figure out the bugs or whether I'm helping someone with their project or their MFA or whether I'm teaching it um, it's constantly there so this week I decided to challenge myself a little bit because um, I decided to give myself a little bit of headway and separate myself from everything just for a couple of days. And what I wanted to do was, uh, like in, in Fusion, I've created a lot of different game engines from a, a golf engine to um, software and aviation, flight tracking and uh, platform games and everything. There's all sorts in there that I've done. But one thing I've never done is a match three game, you know, like the Candy Crush where you can match three, four, five, six, seven. Now, if you're familiar with my, everybody has their own way of developing and designing games. Um, and there's usually kind of like a standard that you have to follow. I mean, if you're going to be serious about a game development, uh, you can have a game design document. Um, however, game design documents, um, I feel, are better for uh, programming. If you're using something like Fusion 2.5, don't really need a game design doc. It's handy to have one, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying don't have one, but I'm saying you don't really need one unless it's a massive game. Like, um, if you're developing something like Sprite, for example, I always reference Sprite because it's a beautiful looking game. Um, Vol, the guy the, the guy behind the development, he's got, um, he's got so many unique ideas and the implementation of some of the routines he's done are out of this world, are really good. Um, he knows what he's doing. He knows he knows he wants a camera to move in a certain way. He's going to spend a few hours developing a system where his camera will move in a certain kind of way, and that is serious game development. So if you're going to go down the route of a serious game development and having maybe a storyline um, or whatever, and it's going to be a massive game, then definitely have a game design document but if you're developing something as a prototype like the match 3 engine then you don't really need a game design doc but you do need a bit of pen and paper and there's a reason for that is um, me for example I have I have 10 years professional use with Fusion 2.5 and sometimes I think to myself how would I design or develop something like that in Fusion now I'm a huge fan of being dynamic with fusion with the frame editor a, a lot of people design game engines that are very static and what i mean by that is if i had to say to a hundred people using fusion go and develop uh, a prototype match three engine most people would develop um, a static grid so they would jump into fusion and they would actually design like an 8 by 8 grid and then they will use that grid and the problem with that is what I I have a problem with with that is 
it's not dynamic enough. If you're creating a game engine, whether it's a prototype or not, from the offset, you should think about how you can expand this game engine in the future. You don't want to be writing two, three, four, a thousand events for a game engine, and then afterwards you think, huh, now if I want to change that eight by eight grid to say 12 by 12, you're going to have to root through all that code because of all the static positions you've put in. And it's just going to be a nightmare. You're either going to have to heavily modify the code or you're going to have to delete that code and rewrite it all again. And there's a reason why we have to rewrite. And I'm going to explain this to you right now. This is what I did with the Max 3 engine. Hopefully you can see it on the screen here. Just a little bit of a screenshot, which I've done. I've also recorded my development of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it into a time lapse <clears throat> and upload it to YouTube when I finish. Um, but I wanted to show you everything warts and all. Someone like me, who has used Fusion for 10 years every single day and I've developed crazy stuff with Fusion and some advanced stuff as well, a lot of advanced stuff. Even someone like me can have a hard time getting their head around how you would develop something like this with Fusion because there's so many different ways you can do things, you know, especially when it comes to grid-based stuff. If you're developing a board game or a puzzle game in Fusion, you would typically start, uh, you know, initially you would think, right, okay, I'm going to need some kind of array. Um, I'm going to need uh, maybe a list or two lists or a few lists. Um, you know, you're going to kind of need um, this these kind of objects to hold all your data so I kept thinking to myself well that's the boring way that is how every other developer would approach something like a match 3 um, and I've looked at a couple of match 3 MFAs and that is pretty much the premise people use stuff like the advanced game board object which is typically just a huge array uh, which has a lot of functions built in so you can scan for um, matches left and right and uh, horizontally and vertically and diagonally and all that kind of stuff which is great but I still feel like it's taking away a lot of the experience of actually developing this kind of stuff for yourself in Fusion and the advanced game board object is phenomenal the stuff that you can do in there is really really good and really really handy and that's what Fusion's all about it's all about dropping in objects and extensions that will speed up development and help you um, but if you really want to learn Fusion Everything needs to be dynamic. You need to have full control over the way you render the game engine um, and the way you control the game engine. And that's because if you ever come to port it, you need you need to know in the back of your mind that how everything works. I hope that makes sense. Well, let me give you an example. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, there was a... Um, there was a guy called Sam um, over on the forums, Distant J, and he, he created the game uh, Angry Video Game Nerd, um, and he did really well with it. Uh, at the time, um, when he f I remember when Sam first came along around the forums, it was around 2011, I think, something like that, uh, and he was developing this, this game, um, you could see that it was a, it was a big project to him. It was it was a real and it did it was a big project commercially it was a big project, um, and I'm sure Sam will probably agree with me on this. I'm not going to speak on behalf of him, but looking back on how he developed the engine, I bet you there would have been a lot of things he would have done differently. Five Nights at Freddy's is exactly the same. If Scott could go back, um, if Scott had to go back in time and develop Five Nights at Freddy's all over again, you know, just let's pretend that it wasn't a big success and um, and he had to go back in time and do it all over again, there would be a lot of things that he would do differently because he designed, it's just a trait that Fusion brings to people is you get used to using the frame editor and you get used to creating everything in a static manner. If you go to a programming language, if you're a programming language, or even if you use a scripting language like Lua or something like that, or you use Unity to develop a game, you, when you're programming it, you would already program it um, with um, having that dynamic element in mind. You, you, that's how you would do it. But because people are using 
when people use Fusion 2.5, what they do is because they can visually see it on the screen, they design it on the frame editor as they want it to look, which is great. It's great for development. It's great for prototyping. But the problem is, is as your project gets bigger and bigger and bigger and you may but want to expand on certain elements, it starts to become a bit of a pain in the ass because you, all of a sudden you think to yourself, how can I turn this 8x8 grid into a 12x12 grid without having to re redo all them events that I've done specifically for an 8x8 grid? So I hope I'm making sense of this. So what I did was, that was the challenge with this Max 3 engine. When I opened up Fusion and I started a new application, I knew straight away in the back of my mind, um, and this is where a game design document comes into into play. I knew in the back of my mind that I had to develop the initial grid engine to be dynamic. So the so because I knew further down the line I might want a an, a grid that's three by three, eight by eight, fifteen by fifteen, or maybe some odd numbers. I might even want a grid that's nine by three or three by one or something ridiculous, you know, anything. But the possibilities got to be there. It doesn't mean that I'm going to use that, any of them variations, but I need it to be there just in case. So as soon as I started developing this game, this Max 3 engine, the first thing I did, obviously the first thing that you would do, or the first thing that I approached anyway, was the grid, because the grid is where all the action is. So what I did was I created um, eight columns. I did it eight by eight. Uh, each column was an active, so column 1, column 2, column 3, column 4, and so forth. And then I put them into a qualifier, which was, I think it was the perspective qualifier. That was, that was the best one I could relate to, because it's even got a grid icon, so I'll go with that. So I dropped all the grid columns into a qualifier. And by doing this, straight away I knew that I could then take away columns or add columns and it didn't matter whether there was four columns, eight columns, 15 columns because I was referencing the qualifier so that means all of the objects doesn't matter how many there is as long as they're under that qualifier and I ran with it and it worked um, so it got to the point where I'd, all I did was create a, a set of events that was for the perspective qualifier which was all the column objects um, and it got to the point where I could then go into the frame editor and then change the layout of the grid so I could just delete four columns and the game engine would still work. I could then add another 12 columns and the game engine would still work. I don't have to keep going back to the events just because I've made changes in the frame editor. So you'll notice that um, if you've done any of my courses, you'll notice that when we develop these the games, I always have um, I always like to develop one frame game engines where they are dynamic because that is how you would do it in a programming language you you know when you look at um, massive game engines like look at the quake 3 engine for example the quake 3 engine was one of the was one of the benchmark uh, game engines ever developed it set the precedence for so many other game engines but the quake 3 engine was massive because so many games were made from the Quake 3 engine, such as Soldier of Fortune 2, and there was all sorts developed with the Quake 3 engine, and obviously Quake itself. So what, how the Quake 3 engine worked was, um, they created um, the engine in a modular fashion, so they would create, uh, this is how we handle, um, this is how we handle the ge geometry, this is how we handle um, map loading, this is how we handle, um, weapons um, and then what happens is once the initial game engines developed uh, people who use that game engine or teams that use that game engine can then modify some of the code uh, to make it unique to their own game. So Quake 3, for example, would not play the same as Soldier of Fortune 2. Soldier of Fortune 2 would look so much different to Quake 3, but it's still the same game engine uh, when it comes down to the bare bones. It's like having a car. It's like having a car engine. Um, if you've got a car engine, just because you're driving around in a Honda doesn't mean that it's a Honda engine underneath the bonnet. It could still be a Ford engine. So what happens is it's like having it's like having a universal car engine being built and then manufacturers coming along and using that engine and then just putting their own shell on it and their own type of steering wheel and their own type of interior so you wouldn't even tell that it was a Ford engine unless you looked at it I hope that makes sense
So yeah, so uh, that's what I've been t- that's what I've been working with this week. Um, that's what I've been working with the last couple of days. It's been frying my brain because I don't have a game design document. So sometimes when I leave the computer for a break, such as lunch or maybe to pick the kids up or whatever, when I come back to the computer, sometimes I'm a little bit I'm a little bit lost because there's so much information I'm trying to store in my own head or as to how the engine that I'm developing works. Um, it's a little bit crazy. So I definitely recommend you have a game design doc. Uh, written up if you can. Also take notes on paper. It's good to take notes on paper and just be just be an actual human um, instead of a machine. I mean when we work at these computers we, you know we have all these notepad files open and we save and we think right that's my design doc there in a in a in a note in a little text file in a folder. Don't do that. Don't do that. Why waste time switching between windows when you could have a pen and paper at the side of you on your desk so you could still work in fusion and scribble stuff down on a bit of paper. Um, it's really handy. Um, but another thing I wanted to do with the game engine was because I wanted it to be dynamic, I didn't want to go down the system of um, go down the route of using a system like arrays <coughs> and lists and all that kind of stuff. So what I did was I, I built some manual detectors in there. So if you have an eight by eight grid, um, each each shape would be controlled um, would have four detectors top bottom left and right and if you space these detectors away from the parent shape so like have a if it's a 64 by 64 grid you would have a 32 pixel gap this way you can detect overlaps with other shapes that is that are not the parent so then you can detect those values a lot easier and then what I did was I got the detectors to report back to the parent which shapes were um, surrounding it. So for example, if you had the number two in the center of the grid, um, I developed a for each loop that would literally iterate over the out, outer objects that would tell the number two, right, you've, there's a number three above you, a number one below you, a number six to the left, and a number five to the right. And that was uh, constantly uh, iterating over. There was no performance hit whatsoever. Um, and then I, and then I kind of realized that I didn't need to be running this for each loop all the time. The only time I needed to run it was when um, blocks changed position or you know the blocks had to move down and all that kind of stuff. So then I quickly realized that um, if I was going to develop this engine, it needs to kind of run in a linear fashion. For example, I need to, I can't just have all these four each loops and fast loops running because stuff's going to happen and bugs are going to crop up because stuff's going to happen where stuff shouldn't be happening. For example, if the player's swapping a block, you don't want any four each loops running while the swap's happening because it's going to cause a whole load of chaos because it's going to be doing all these checks so what you want to do is when like for example when the player's moving or swapping blocks you want to cut off all the four each loops all the fast loops don't let anything run let the player do the swap and then uh, get all the four each loops to do the checks and everything and you know so it, it's going all right I'm, I'm i'm recording it as i go along because i want to i want to put it together uh, as a compilation video and like a little time lapse video to put on YouTube so you guys can see how I did that so hopefully <laughs> hopefully I'll get that out by the end of the week but um, yeah there's a lot of stuff going down with that so so what I'm trying to get at is in this podcast with this topic is when you approach something like this infusion um, or you want to develop a prototype what I highly recommend you do is um, sometimes it, if it's a puzzle game or something like that it's good to go away from the main project infusion and open up a new project and just build one section of the code at a time. Like for example, the Match 3, if I was going to give the Match 3 game engine, say you, you want to develop your own Match 3 game engine in Fusion, then what I recommend you do is um, create the first bit of code which is populating the grid. So having um, shapes in the grid, uh, if there's any empty blocks, fill them back in. Then open a new project, copy that code over to, the, to a, a new MFA and then use that new MFA to figure out how you're going to do your block swapping code and then in another MFA um, code um, use that to code in um, the match three four five six seven eight checking and then what you can if you do all these in in, in different MFAs uh, then what you can do is you can go back to your main engine and then 
copy and paste your routines into the main engine once they work and this should just work straight off the bat and this way you're separating you're separating the, the functions so so one mfa will have the function of um, match checking in it and then save that mfa uh, and that's got one routine in it then and then and then your other mfa that does the block swapping save that mfa save it as block swapping and save them all as individual routines and then put all the routines together into one project and that way if there any bugs do crop up you can go back to the mfa that just has that section of coding and tweak it if you need to and then bring it back in i just find it a lot easier if it's more modular to do it like that so that's my tip that's my tip for the month anyway <laughs> if you're going to do stuff like that uh in future but yeah hopefully by the end of the week uh, you can see a video uh, of what I've done with that. So, uh, the Fusion Workshop 101 was uh, quite a success. Uh, it ran throughout May. I've still got two or three lectures still to do on that. Um, I'm just waiting for um, some of the guest uh, guest speakers to get back to me as to when they can do um, their workshops because we've got a couple of workshops that are still pending and I had some internet problems as well towards the end of May which is very frustrating I think I talked about it in the last podcast or one of my videos um, but it, it, we are with an ISP called Talk Talk over here which are basically just reselling BT's lines um, and they were coming up with all this COD's wallop for two weeks you know the internet I think I was getting 0.1 meg download eventually and I was calling them up and every time you call up an ISP like that you're always going to get um, first line support where the reading off a computer and saying have you turned your router off and all this and there's nothing more frustrating especially when you've been working with computers for the last 20 odd years you know and I've got a lot of networking experience and, and there's nothing more frustrating than ringing up a, a, co a company for support and um, you know you get hit with all these silly questions I understand why they have to do it which is very frustrating and in the end it turned out that Talk Talk were lying to us um, so yeah a bit of bit of bad press for talk talk i don't really care i feel like they deserve it um they, they lied to us because when the engineer came around um and I, I was talking to him about what had been going on um i said to him um basically talk talk were saying that uh, for two weeks they were saying this every time we called up they said that there was an the main one of the main exchanges which was 20 miles from where we lived there was a problem there when the engineer came round after two weeks of calling up literally every single day and we demanded an engineer came round, the engineer came round, he went over to our exchange box, which is just down the road, so there's the, the exchange for the street, and he said, oh yeah, um, the uh, patch cable for your house has corroded. So it was absolutely nothing to do with any problems that were 20 mile away in an exchange. It was literally the box down the road and I did keep telling them um, that this was a serious issue and they didn't want to listen. So yeah, they effectively they lied to us. Uh, we didn't get any reimbursement, we didn't get any refund for, for the two weeks, we didn't get nothing, we didn't even get a sorry. Um, so yeah, <laughs> so that's so basically that hindered the uh, towards the end of the Fusion Workshop 101 because we had um, I think there was only four four uh, video uh, four sessions left, um, but then four sessions are still pending. Uh, I'm going to hopefully get them done this week, and that's the Fusion Workshop 101 wrapped up. It's been really exciting. It's a live course for Fusion 2.5. If you're unaware of it, um, we sold the tickets. Uh, for the Fusion Workshop 101 before the launch, so because it was limited seats available, uh, there's so many, there's only so many um, people we could have had on the course for the live sessions. Um, but once the Fusion Workshop 101 is complete, it will be available uh, for everybody else who wasn't a part of it. You'll be able to sign up and get access to the Fusion Workshop 101. But it's been really, really, really good. We've had loads of interaction with people. Um, you know, I've been doing some of the, most of the live streams. I've done all the live streams up to now. Uh, and I've been talking to people live they've been asking questions why do you do that such a way and why you know can you do this and 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 they've also been asking stuff like how do you do this so I would show them live on the session um, you know how they can achieve like wheel spinning effects with mud and all that kind of stuff with fusions it's been it's been awesome I knew it was going to be a good idea I thought the idea back in March 
you know, and I thought, why not do a live course? It's the first of a kind, uh, and the Fusion Workshop 101 is perfect. We've learned all sorts uh, with the Fusion Workshop 101. It's been all sorts of different types of uh, webinars, such as fast loops and uh, for each loops and visual effects, and there's been all sorts in there. You'll be able to check it out. I'll post a link into the description below this, um, but you'll be able to check it out for yourself. But yes, I, I certainly will be doing another Fusion Workshop um, possibly this year um, and hopefully we can get uh, more people um, into the next one because this one was a little bit limited because of the seating and how many people we could get on a live stream but in the next one we'll certainly be able to get a lot more in there uh, it's been very enjoyable we get, I'm getting a lot of really good feedback and I've had a lot of good feedback uh, for it as well which is good because I, knew, I, knew, I already knew it was rolling good it's every time we start up a live stream it's always good to get interactive and talking with other people but uh, yeah hopefully the next fusion workshop we'll definitely be able to get more seats available for that all right so um, what else have we got fusion 3 <laughs> I always love hitting this topic. Everybody keeps asking about Fusion 3. And to be honest, with the release of 2.5 Plus with the DLC, um, obviously people are kind of more familiar with what's going on now with Click Team and Fusion 3. So I don't have too much explaining to do. Um, but as you uh, may or may not know, Fusion 3 is still in development. It is still in development. A couple of... Um, Click Team have been concentrating a lot on porting games for PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. And these ports have enabled Click Team to generate uh, two pros to it. One is generate more funding uh, for Fusion 3. And two is to allow us to kind of generate, uh, build Fusion 3 asynchronously with the porting projects because some of the techniques that we've had to develop for the porting has enabled us to um, develop these routines ready for Fusion 3. Um, it's, it's hard to explain like some of the, hopefully you've already got it, but for those that haven't it's like th th when, you, when we're porting to PlayStation 4 and Xbox One there's a lot of new routines that have to come into play, um, you know, rendering routines and the way visuals are, the way the, the game tick works and the way everything's rendered to the screen. So what we've done is we've obviously we have to develop them for the ports. So what we do is as we develop these for the ports, these routines, they're already kind of ready for Fusion 3 then. So there's a lot of other things that go on uh, as well surrounding that. But uh, so Fusion 3 development at the minute is on pause because we're still uh, going through all the uh, all the porting projects, but again, there's, it's it's beneficial because one, it funds Click Team um, to ensure that Fusion 3 development uh, can continue. Uh, f and obviously, the second pro is that we are technically developing routines for Fusion 3 as we do the porting project. So it's all good in the hood. Apart from that, I've nothing really uh, much else to report on Fusion 3. Um, personally. Uh, there are a couple of um, things that I would like to see happening before 2020, uh, which only gives us six months, and that is that uh, Click Team. You've got to remember that Click Team. We are, uh, you know, we don't have hundreds of employees. Um, we have uh, programmers, we have support guys, um, and obviously we deal with a lot of schools as well. Um, and we, we don't forget we have all the channels to support we've got discord we've got steam uh, we've got the forums um, uh, we've got the schools uh, we've got um, email we've got a ticket system there's all sorts of avenues where we have to keep supporting users and all this kind of stuff so don't think that you know we just sit around uh, having fun all the time and making jokes um, it's not like that at all uh, we are constantly working um, like for example, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, you've got Simon, who um, is head of Click Team UK. He also looks after the web servers. He looks after all the websites, all the web services, as well as trying to run Click Team UK. So he's providing support for UK schools and uh, UK customers, and as well as do all the infrastructure um, for Click Team um, on the site. Um, what else do we have? Uh, let's look at Jeff. He's head of Click Team USA. Um, Jeff, again, 
uh, like Simon has all the schools to deal with and support, has all the users to deal with, um, complaints and um, support, help and support that come through on email, ticket systems, and it, this is, some people are still ordering on CD and DVD, you know, so he has all them to package up and ship out, and there's, there's all sorts, and then you've got the programmers that are working on 2.5, 2.5 plus, working on the ports, um, looking at bugs, you know, so there's a lot of stuff that's going down all the time. Um, with uh, ClickTeam, but one thing that I would like to see, which I have mentioned before, I think I've mentioned it on one of my podcasts, but I have mentioned it in ClickTeam, uh, and that is um, a rebrand uh, before 2020. We need a rebrand. I don't, you know, I, I have no problems in airing this over the podcast. I've already aired it to ClickTeam um, in our chat room, uh, but we do severely need uh, a rebrand. Now, the, the guys at ClickTeam, it's not that they're not bothered about a rebrand or making or making it look better. You've got to remember, we have a product, Fusion 2.5 and 2.5 Plus, which, regardless of what it looks like, is still an awesome software. It's still, um, it's still current in 2019. So, you know, even though, in my opinion, some of the stuff... Um, looks a little bit outdated uh, with regards to the website and you know that kind of stuff and that's just my that's just my personal opinion uh, which it is um the, the product is still um it, it's it, it's in my opinion uh, this is in my opinion as well is it still ahead of the competition regardless of um you know any new software that comes out um fusion 2.5 you got to remember is has been built on for the last 20 years that's a lot of experience um eve who obviously is the big kahuna here at click team um he's constantly working on fusion 2.5 to make it as fast as possible the, the stuff he's done with optimizing fast loops internally for each loops um and and he loves he loves having the runtime uh on par um he, he you know it, as soon as a bug comes up um that's that affects the performance of the Fusion runtime, he's all over it. He wants to make sure that uh, the runtime is as fast as possible. And like I said, you know, Fusion 3 will be a massive um, breath of fresh air for Click Team when it is released. But for the time being, Fusion 2.5 and 2.5 Plus still are still relevant in 2019. There's nothing we can't do with Fusion 2.5 right now. Um, we can develop... Uh, Android games, iOS games, uh, HTML5 games, Windows games, everything runs smooth. Um, you know, there's nothing, just because, um, you know, Click Team have been going for over 20 years and, um, you know, you don't need a Fusion 3, in my opinion. Right now, you don't, you can, you can want a Fusion 3, but you don't need a Fusion 3. You don't need a Fusion 3. You don't. If anybody can, if anybody can come at me with a valid argument as to what Fusion 3 would offer them right now that Fusion 2.5 can't, then I'll debate it with you. But in my opinion, there's nothing you, you can do. What can't you develop right now in Fusion 2.5? It's it's all there. So what if the so what if the software looks like it was developed in 1998? Who cares? It's not about what it looks like. It's about what it can do. And Fusion 2.5 is so powerful. A lot of people still underestimate what it can do. Don't get me wrong. There are grievances. There are there are a couple of things that could be improved. Um, not with the runtime, but with the editing process. Yeah, there are, there are a few tweaks and nags and whatever but i'm talking about the power of the fusion 2.5 runtime it's it's phenomenal um we still have people developing games right now and click team are porting them across to playstation 4 and xbox one so that tells you just how good fusion 2.5 as a product is um so yeah the, don't get me wrong in, uh, again i will reiterate in my personal opinion uh branding for click team is a little bit it's, it's getting a little bit bland it's getting a little bit old now um but the, you've got to remember these guys are concentrating on running the business these guys are concentrating on um you know ensuring that the product works uh, ensuring that it's optimized and obviously the, the fusion 3 work and the porting of the consoles a uh, console project so there's a lot of stuff that goes on um in click team a lot of stuff um and we have some very very talented people uh working at click team um, and I'm just a guy in the back 
that, well, I'm not just the guy in the back, but I am, when it comes to branding, I'm the guy in the back that's going, hey, we need to we need to change this up. We're in 2019 now, we're nearly in 2020. We need to change this up. So hopefully by 2020, if I keep voicing my opinion, we should have a, a rebrand. But you've got to remember, again, that the, the focus here for Click Team, or especially for the programmers and stuff, is... The, the runtime and the core products it's not about branding it's about making sure the, the core product works um, in my opinion the branding is uh, a necessity for going forward and um, ensuring that brand awareness is uh, uh, something that I'm, I'm a firm believer in brand awareness is massive if you look at the click fusion uh, academy um, i take brand awareness very serious because brand awareness when it comes to marketing is uh, is a serious game it's it's a serious game um you know it's strange that it's strange that an image an image can leave a mark in someone's mind that the engine can't like <laughs> like you could have uh, let's go back to the car analogy again so say you've got two cars you could have one car that looks ugly but can do 250 mile an hour in no point in in notes of three seconds or you could have a car that looks really really good and really really slick but it takes it takes uh 10 seconds to get up to 250 mile an hour People are still more than likely going to go with the car that looks good, even though it doesn't perform as good as the ugly one. And that, my friends, is branding. And I'm always a keen, I'm always a keen advocate for good, solid branding. Um, so that's why I keep mentioning it to Click Team. I keep bringing it up, um, and you know, I've already put forth my ideas. Um, you know what I think. Um, in uh, in great detail, <laughs> trust me, documents and all sorts. But if you look at the Click Fusion Academy, if you get a two minute, if you get two minutes, just take a look at the website. Um, I take branding very serious. You know, you look at the logo. The logo is on every single page. Um, the colour scheme for the website is um, it has continuity to it. So no matter what section you're on on the website, you still get the white, the blue. The white and the blue are the strongest points um, because that's in the logo. You incorporate, you design everything. You have continuity throughout your products from your logo. So the ClickFusion logo is blue and white primarily, so the website should be blue and white. It's, it's continuity. It helps, um, you know, and the way everything looks. I mean, when, when Nico redid, if you look at the ClickTeam Fusion logo now, um, if you, if you don't know where it is, you you'll be able to get it by uh, in Fusion. If you click on the Help menu and click on About, you'll see the new Fusion logo. So you can see how we are already implementing these steps. I just think it's a lot more important. I think I, th you know, I think it's a lot more important um, than other people. But again, most of the people at Click Team, most of the guys that work for Click Team, are concentrating on the runtime and you know the porting projects and the programming which is absolutely fine i'm more than happy to be that guy at the back that keeps saying we need to do this we need to do that uh, because i know eventually we will do um but again it's all about time but yeah um it's uh it, there's a lot of things that's going to happen I, i'll keep the podcast going anything else i can keep you posted but when it comes to fusion 3 i can't really give you anything else right now because there's not really much else to give you what i can what I've, i haven't already told you but hey ho uh and finally i just want to touch on one click training so if you're um if you're not familiar with one click training it's a new um it's the new website the new infrastructure that i launched back in uh, March of this year um, and basically I, t I took all my Udemy courses and put them all onto my old website so I have complete control over uh, everything to do with the courses because on Udemy I felt like I was u there was you know, I was using that as a platform um, to do these courses um, but in the end I didn't have complete control over my content I didn't have any marketing control whatsoever um, Customer relations with people who had signed up to my courses were quite minimal. They weren't the best of options. Now that I have all the courses on my own infrastructure, I can communicate better with students 
um, and and members um, and we have a ticket system in there which comes directly to me so if you've got any problems with any of the courses any questions or anything they come straight to me and I can uh, relate them back to you uh, we have loads of special offers on whatever I'm not going to be developing any more for you Demi any new courses that I do one clicks infusion 2.5 uh, and in the future we'll go on the one click training website so if you've not been you can check that out at one click dot training um, all the courses are there um, for you to sign up to you can access them lifetime access um, as soon as you sign up you've got access to that course for life no matter what happens um, and any future courses I'm going to be putting on there as well the courses are really good um, they are different from the Academy because um, when you sign up to a course uh, with the Academy you learn about you learn about Fusion 2.5 from the beginning um, and you you can learn a lot of stuff at the academy. With one click training it's a different type of learning because you know what you're going to be learning about and it's specifically about that topic like for example build a quiz app or build a platform. It, it, the course from A to Z is specifically about that topic um, and, and some people say well why do you have both and, and the simple answer is because some people um, well th there's a market for both some people want to be part of the academy, so they want to feel like they're a member of something that's um, professional um, and it achieves a different um, objective than what the courses do. And some people might not want to join the academy, but they want to sign up to the courses because they want an A to Z on that specific topic. So. The options are there, and that's why I do both. I teach a lot of Fusion 2.5. I do a lot of Skype teaching. I have one-to-one -one sessions with people, um, you know, on a weekly basis, and I teach people Skype from their own home. You know, I sit down at my computer, they sit down at their computer, and we work together doing screen sharing, and I teach them fundamentals about what they want to learn about and stuff like that. So I teach a lot of Fusion 2.5. So to have the academy separate from one-click training um, is the surefire way to go because, again, um, some people want to join the academy where they have, um, you know, there's different there's different benefits to the academy than what it is to the courses, and the courses have different benefits than what they do to the academy. So they both work together, um, but they have different objectives. Um, some people are a member of the academy and members of the courses. A lot of people are. I have a lot of people that are members of the academy, and they are members of all the courses as well. I have some keen. Uh, followers which is really good because it's um, uh, you know that's, it feels really good to me uh, to know that I have a, a base of people that like to you know that, that like the content that I'm producing it's really good I'm, I'm not on Patreon I'm not asking for $500 a month I'm not asking for a $1,000 a month I just do this stuff I put it together this is my content this is my package this is the price you want it come and get it and I, you'll notice I have discounts on all over the place because I want things to be affordable for everybody wherever possible um so yeah check that out one click dot training and the academy don't forget to check that out uh, there's not really much more for me to touch on in this podcast uh, we're coming up to uh, nearly an hour on this podcast i think it's one of the longest podcasts i've ever done i hope i have not bored you to death um <laughs> I am going to definitely do the live podcast at the end of July, which is only three weeks away. So I'm going to build up some hype for that. I'm going to send out some emails. Um, I'm going to create a forum a forum post over on the Click Team uh, forums as well. We'll get people involved. Get yourself on Discord. If you're not already there, check it out um, on Discord. Uh, and we're going to set up a little podcast channel where we can get people in. Um, and you can also join me on the on the live voice as well. If you if any of you guys have a headset and you're not afraid to voice your opinion, jump on the um, on the voice section of Discord. I want you guys to come on. If you if you've got a voice, come and bring it on. Talk to me. Talk. To, it's what podcasts are for, so we can all talk together um, and whatnot. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. We'll set it up and we'll sort it out. Thanks for tuning into this podcast. Um, I hope you've had a good listen. I hope I've not bored you to death. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you want to be notified of uh, future um, future videos. Uh, and future podcasts uh, that we do uh, but my name's Danny J I'm signing out uh, and I'll see you guys in the next podcast thanks for tuning in